during the indian struggle for independence there were five barristers of note one of those is barrister vinayak damodar savarkar when i say five barristers the other barristers involved are barrister mohammad ali jinnah barrister baba saheb ambedkar barrister mahatma gandhi and barrister pandit jawahar lal nehru the name that i mentioned at the outset barrister savarkar who was born in a village of bhagur near nasik district in maharashtra right from his childhood savarkar was inspired by the indian movement and revolution for freedom and he had started a friends circle in bhagur the two names i remember are mr bhat from yevle and savarkar's own older brother baba savarkar for higher education barrister savarkar came to pune to study at the ferguson college around 1904 or 05 right before his graduation he was involved in a movement in which he participated actively where clothing that was made in foreign countries outside of india were being burnt because of this the principal of ferguson college wrangler paranspe was not happy with savarkar in 1905 savarkar went to england for the study of law while in england savarkar was active in a movement which was in a way terrorist activities he had gone to england on a scholarship provided by krishna varma one of the major activities performed by him during his stay in england were to send firearms secretly to india one of these pistols was used in 1910 when the collector of nashik collector jackson was fired upon by a mr anant kanhere due to the connection between mr anant kanhere and mr savarkar he was arrested as a terrorist by england and savarkar was sent on a ship to travel to india for his trial here are evident the leaps of mr savarkar's ability one was that being a poet he wrote a poem called sagara pran tarmala meaning o ocean my heart is suffering for my motherland this is considered an epic poem also there was a scheme for the escape of mr savarkar during his ship journey accordingly when the ship reached paris actually it should be marseille in france mr savarkar under the pretense of going to use the restroom he leaped out of the ship literally into the ocean and swam to the shore if regular protocol was followed it should have been the government of france to have tried mr savarkar however the british convinced them to release savarkar to the custody of the british to be transported back to india after his trial he was sentenced to two terms of imprisonment 
called Kala Pani or Black Water in 1910. Kala Pani refers to those prisons which are located in uninhabited, far away remote areas from where the chances of breaking out are impossible and the facilities provided are very minimal that people are not expected to return back alive from them. Savarkar was sent to the Kalapani prison in the Andaman Islands. So when he was being sent there, let us consider what were the other prisons where freedom fighters were being sent. One prison was in Rangoon where in 1908 Lokmanya Tilak was imprisoned. Another such prison was in Aden where Vasudev Balwant was imprisoned. During his prison stay, he experienced many atrocities. A main one was that he was made to do the work what ordinarily oxen would do, which is to physically pull a crushing press. Here, a human being was being made to use physical strength that is expected from oxen. I do not know of any other political prisoner who was subjected to such harsh conditions during imprisonment. By coincidence, his older brother, Baba Rao Savarkar, was also imprisoned same location and he was able to meet his brother. During this stay, Savarkar created many works of poetry, including one poem called Kamala. But how to write this down? So, he used black charcoal pieces to write on the limestone walls of the prison. And by secret methods, the work was written on pieces of paper and smuggled out of the prison to India for publication. Up until 1920, Savarkar's work did not have much influence on the political situation in India. Until 1920, Lokmanya Tilak's influence was strong on Indian politics and after Lokmanya Tilak passed away, the leadership came to Mahatma Gandhi. By coincidence, Savarkar's ideology, I would not say was opposite of Mahatma Gandhi, but was not in line with the non-violent Gandhian ideology. After 1924, he wasn't pardoned or completely released free from the Andaman prison, but the location of his imprisonment was changed to house arrest in Ratnagiri district of Maharashtra. The two conditions set on him were he could not leave the location and he could not take part in Indian politics or freedom struggle. In keeping with that, Savarkar did not participate on the Indian political scene. However, he did not stay quiet and he worked towards the improvement of conditions of untouchables or Harijans. Unfortunately, the people belonging to the higher castes in Maharashtra did not agree or appreciate this cause. Later on in life, the same higher caste population did appreciate and praise highly of Savarkar. However, during the stay in Ratnagiri, he was ignored. But Savarkar, with the help of a Mr. Bhagoji Kir, built a temple in Ratnagiri where people of lower castes could worship freely. This is one of the big contributions by Mr. Savarkar. Along with this, Savarkar has done work 
in the improvement of language and improvement in script writing. He also had a scientific mind and his approach to many society's issues was very scientific and logical. For example, a cow is considered holy by Hindus, but his thought process was that cow is a useful animal. She should be protected because she gives us milk. She is a useful beast. She produces strong offspring and therefore should be protected. This was an approach he suggested in those times. In 1937, there were elections held for the Bombay presidency. During these elections of the Bombay Assembly were invited Congress, Hindu Mahasabha, Mr. Ambedkar's party, some Maratha parties. Surprisingly, the Hindu Mahasabha did not get much votes and support. And the most success went to the Congress party under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi with its non-violent and loom-wielding policies. Even the reserved seats for untouchables did not go to the Hindu Mahasabha party. In any case, after Lokmanya Tilak's death in 1920, the leadership went to Mahatma Gandhi, as I have mentioned before. The movement of non-cooperation in 1921, the Satyagraha in Bardoli in 1922, the Great Salt March in 1930 at Dandi were all major struggles done by Congress party under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi involved the participation of a large number of the untouchable Harijan Samaj as well as women in the freedom struggle. The Salt March of Dandi was a huge movement which involved foot march all the way from Ahmedabad to the seashore at Dandi where a sea of humanity just marched on like waves. In 1928, the Simon Commission was sent by England to India. To oppose this, many freedom fighters protested and they were beaten by the authorities. Lala Lajpat Rai, part of the Lal Bal Pal trilogy, also suffered physical injuries during his protests received at the hands of the British officers. During this time, there were two round table conferences held in England. The Congress party was not invited at the first conference. However, the British then realized that holding the round table conference without the presence of the Congress party was similar to making a collection of the works of Shakespeare without the prince Hamlet in it. So they invited Congress and the Congress party sent Mahatma Gandhi as their spokesperson and leader to this meeting. During this conference, it was suggested that a separate voting block be created for the untouchables and the British agreed and were making movement towards this plan. But in 1932, during his stay in the Yeravda jail, Mahatma Gandhi went on a fast to oppose this movement. The fast ran for many days. Finally, it ended after Mr. Ambedkar went to a meeting 
with Mr. Gandhi and they came to a compromise and agreement. Elections were held afterwards and in Central Assembly too, Congress won the majority of seats. The Congress party also attempted to secure majority in the then Bombay Presidency state. In 1937 or so, during the interim government, a Mr. Jamna Das, who was the Home Minister, worked diligently to release Mr. Savarkar from his imprisonment and his efforts were successful and Mr. Savarkar was released from imprisonment in Ratnagiri in 1937. The story of Mr. Savarkar's release and travel to Bombay is interesting. In those days, when people came from Ratnagiri to Bombay, they came via boat and the journey took eight to nine hours. However, Mr. Savarkar went by road from Ratnagiri to Kolhapur where he stayed few days with Mr. Bhalji Pendarkar who was an important filmmaker at the time. From there, by Mr. Pendarkar's car, he travelled to Miraz and held a rally and speech there. And although I have not attended the speech myself, my father has attended it personally. From Miraj, he went to Sangli for a speech and then came back to Miraj. He went to the religious temple in Pandharpur and from there has gone to Bombay. Unfortunately, Savarkar was not very successful in the elections, not in 1937, not in 1946, and the public largely supported the Congress party during both these elections. The World War II started in 1939 and the Congress party was not in support of this World War II involvement and they announced that this was not a struggle for India to be involved in. On the other hand, Mr. Savarkar encouraged all Indians to enlist in the British Army and to go receive military training and arms training to empower themselves to fight against the British eventually. This encouraged many youth from the Brahmin community to join the army. As a consequence, in 1945, after the war ended and the British were defeated in Burma, Siam, Malaya, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose created Azad Hind Force and many youth inspired by Mr. Savarkar joined this force. Savarkar had a conflict with the ideology of the Congress party. 
At the same time, he did not get along very well with members of the RSS, Rashtriya Seva Sangh, with whom his ideologies matched somewhat. So he had created a separate organization called Hindu Rashtra Dal. And the sad part is, Mr. Nathuram Godse, who was the assassin of Mahatma Gandhi, was the leader of Hindu Rashtra Dal. And Nathuram Godse was highly influenced by Savarkar. On 30th January 1948, Nathuram Godse assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. And following this, there were arrests made and Mr. Savarkar was also arrested and tried. Nathuram Godse, his friend Narayan Apte, Savarkar, an arms supplier from Pune by the name of Badge, were all implicated in the assassination plot. Savarkar was released by the district court and the court did absolve him guilt-free. However, in the public opinion, because Savarkar was the mentor for Nathuram Godse, he was considered guilty in their minds. In a way, unfortunately, he was shunned by the public. A good part is that on 15th August 1947, after India obtained independence from the British, Savarkar did hoist the flag of India on his own house and in a way he was a national leader and he behaved like a national leader with hoisting the tricolor flag on his house. Savarkar's poetry, his speeches, fluent and incomparable speeches are remarkable. In around 1957, there was a centenary celebration to mark 100 years of the Indian mutiny of 1857 and in Pune, there were 100,000 people attending a speech by Mr. Savarkar on this occasion and I have been very fortunate to be able to attend that speech. Savarkar was a man of principle, a revolutionary, a man with a scientific and logical mindset and an epoch-making freedom fighter. To such a man, one of the five barristers involved in India's freedom struggle, I offer my respects. He passed away in 1966 in Dadar, Mumbai, and I have been able to attend his funeral. I offer my salute and respects to Mr. Savarkar. Thank you.